John 15, 1, 3, we're going to be talking about the vines and the branches and the vine dresser. And uh, so a little bit of a, a backstory here while you guys are, are getting into uh, John. Uh, we're looking at John 15, 1 through 8. It says, um, so Jesus has just finished up his last earthly supper. Okay, he got done washing the disciples' feet. Uh, and he's also uh, at this point pointed out that Judas is his betrayer uh, and told him, you better get about your business quickly. And I believe Judas probably scooted out of there without even strapping on his sandals. And uh, so uh, as they sat there, you know, I, I believe Jesus was starting to go under pressure, true amount of pressure, trying to uh, trying to pound as much information into the disciples' heads as he possibly can because he knows what's coming in the very near future. And as he's answering questions for Peter and Thomas and Philip and, and the other Judas, um, man, I just I, I feel like he got exasperated. He, just, he, he was just at wit's end. Um, so he starts uh, talking to his 11 disciples, and uh, this is what he says, John 15. Uh, you know what, let me, let me pray first. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. God, I thank you for the beautiful sunshine outside. And Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to come up and speak your word. God, I, uh, uh, I know this is a big deal, uh, Lord, to, to be up in this pulpit. And, and Lord, I, I don't want to take this for granted. Lord, I need you to uh, be with me in this time. Uh, be with my lips as I speak. Uh, be with my heart as I uh, put out your word. Lord, I ask that you be with me everybody that's out here this evening lord that they might receive a little bit of something out of this message lord i uh i just uh i just pray that you just come on down and have a seat and be with us lord because you always say anywhere two or more are gathered i am there also so lord i just pray that you uh you're with us right now god i just want to say i thank you and love you for everything that you do for us amen so it says here in uh Chapter 15, verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bear much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not, uh, yeah, if anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you, um, if you abide in me and my word abides in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So you will be my disciples. So here we see a very descriptive statement from Jesus. Uh, so let's break this down and give it a little bit of context. Uh, verse 1 has two parts to it. Uh, it's first, why? Verse 1. I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Seems fairly straightforward, right? But why does Jesus say, I am the true vine? Why not just the vine? In order to find that out, we actually have to go into Isaiah uh, chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. I'm not going to read it. I'm going to kind of give you my little bit of take on it. Uh, it says here that God has planted a vine uh, in a garden, and he planted it in the choicest of soil. He, plant, he cleared everything out. He picked the perfect ground. He built a wine press. He built a tower. He did everything correctly. This was supposedly Israel. But instead of good fruit, good vines, producing good seed, producing good wine, Israel gave him sour, wild grapes that did what their hearts desired and walked not with God but walked for man. You see, Jesus wanted to make a very distinct line in the sand saying that I am the true vine. I'm not Israel. God planted me here, the perfect seed. 
the perfect seed on earth to bring me, or excuse me, to bring his most beloved uh, creation, us, back to him. So the second part of this verse says uh, that God is the vine dresser. The vine dresser has a job of, well, dressing the vines. You see, a vine, dresser, uh, uh, vine dresser's job, or the vine gardener, uh, he doesn't just stop after planting the seed in the ground and walking away. Um, he, uh, once the vine starts to sprout, he needs to set boundaries or guide wires, right? Um, and uh, he needs to make sure that nothing strangles out the vine. So the vine starts growing up. There's these guide wires, and, and, and he needs to make sure that the vine grows up just correctly and, um, and, and that nothing starts wrapping around to choke that vine out. So he's got to make sure that the suckers are always removed. Um, he needs to also make sure uh, that um, the fruit is good before harvesting, right? And all during this time, he's trimming and feeding and making sure that it gets water in the right amount of sunlight. So now we have a very clear idea of who's doing what here. God is the vine dresser. Jesus is the vine, right? But there is no way, uh, a shape or form, that these two are offset, right? Because Jesus and God are one. They're, this, they're, they're equals, However, uh, or what's, what's cool about this analogy here is that all three are actually seen here, whether you realize it or not. You got God, the vine dresser. Jesus uh, is the vine. But also the Holy Spirit here is present also because he's here as the sunlight, the water, and the earth. Um, lost my spot here for a second. Oh, yeah. Okay. So verse 2. <laughs> Uh, verse two states, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away and every branch that bears fruit, uh, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. So the vine dresser's job at this point is to make sure, uh, that all the energy goes to the right branches. Um, at this point, um, and, and excuse me, that those branches bear fruit. So what the uh, vine dresser is actually looking for now is he's actually looking for telltale signs. He's looking for something to go, this is a good branch, right? So when I was out uh, pruning my apple trees this year, I hadn't pruned my apple trees in years. So what did I do this spring? I'm looking around. I'm actually got my head up inside my apple tree looking around, and I'm starting to notice that I had huge branches that had nothing but leaves on them. But I had other branches that had flowers and blossoms all over them. So I could tell right away that those, the, the branches that had no blossoms on them, those were the sucker branches. They were just taking energy out of my trees. Um, if a branch doesn't bear fruit, it is useless to the vine except to suck the energy and the sap from the vine and it is removed. However, um, he looks uh, for flowers um, and blossoms. Excuse me, guys. I'm so sorry. I keep losing my tra uh, train of thought here. However, the gardener looks for telltale signs to see if the branch will start bearing fruit. He looks for flowers and blossoms instead of just leaves. He would also look for clusters of flowers and grapes and actually remove some of those when there are too many in a bunch. Because if there's too many in a bunch... It'll over it, it, the, the ones that he wants to grow, they won't be able to get large enough. Vine dresser will also remove, which is something I didn't realize, is that they'll remove the last one to two feet of a branch because that one to two feet of a branch could actually snap off in the wind or it could actually block the sunlight from hitting, um, hitting the, the fruit and making it uh, grow larger. Uh, so it was something I, I didn't realize. Um, also, if a, if a branch is not trimmed, the energy will go out to those leaves uh, and that the uh, that'll actually suck energy out of there. Um, so how does this translate for us, his creation? You see, the father prunes the branches by removing anything that would sap the spiritual energy and hinder them from the fruitless results. His pruning involves cutting away anything that limits righteousness 
including uh, the discipline that comes from trials, suffering, and persecution. The knowledge that God uses uh, the pain that Christians endure for their ultimate good should eliminate all fear, self-pity, and complaining. In Hebrews 12, 7 through 11, um, I actually use the English Standard Version here because I, I, I think it said it uh, clearer um, for me to understand. Uh, it says here that the uh, uh, reminds those undergoing painful pruning ch and chastening that, in verse 7 starts, it is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have an earthly father who disciplines us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirit and live? For they discipline us for a short time, and it seems best for them. But, the dis uh, but he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness for the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields a peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So in order to grow, we need pruning in our lives. Sometimes it's a slight pruning. Sometimes it's a large pruning. Um, it could be something minor as catching a flat tire on the side of the road to say, hey, listen, I need you to slow down a minute. I need you to look at me. Another uh, another pruning could be um, wanting sons, but God giving you daughters to teach you that you need some softening and you need to learn patience. <laughs> but it could be an also a major pruning, like your loved one passing away to make you stronger and to make you realize that you can do things on your own. Verse 3. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Simply as Jesus talking about the 11 disciples back in chapter 13, verse 10. Uh, which states, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. You see, Jesus handpicked the 11, 12, however, but the one got picked by Satan to deceive, right? Uh, and uh, so Jesus knew that these 11 were his true followers. Not all people that believe in God are saved. Not all people that know Jesus was a good teacher are saved. Not all people that read the Scriptures are cleaned by the Word. It's only those who truly believe in the true vine that are cleaned and have a one-way ticket punched to heaven. So moving forward a couple verses here, we're going to go into verse 4 and 5. It says, Abide in me and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, and I in him bear much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. In layman's terms, this is truly easy. If you don't stay close to Jesus, you can't grow. If you don't grow, you're not going to bear fruit. Or in this case, do any kind of good works for God. No one can do anything for God if he isn't walking with God and having a relationship with him. Otherwise, you're just doing good things as a good person. Verse 6 says, If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. Uh, my Bible, uh, my study Bible at home had a, a, a great commentary on this, so I'm going to read it uh, verbatim here. It says, my Bible, uh, <laughs> probably shouldn't have highlighted that part. <laughs> Not abiding in Christ has serious consequences. The uh, Number one, the person is cast out as a branch, indicating the loss of fellowship. Two, the person is withered, indicating the loss of vitality. Three, the person is burned, 
indicating a loss of reward. The fire here is figurative, symbolizing either fiery trials or a fire at the judgment seat of Christ. Failure to abide produces in spiritual disaster. You see, if a, a while back, probably before most of you guys even knew me, um, I was dealing with some some spiritual issues, right? I was I was walking the walk as a Christian. I was talking the talk as a Christian, but I wasn't acting like a Christian. I was going places that I shouldn't be going. I was hanging out with people that I shouldn't be hanging out with. I, I was definitely going places I shouldn't be going. And, and, it, and it took a visit from Pastor John to uh, make me realize that I was actually falling. My, my branch was starting to snap and wither. Eventually feeling disconnected from God, uh, you could see the darkness in me starting to bear. If I continued breaking away from Jesus, the true vine, there was no way I was going to stay connected to the vine. I was letting, letting Satan wick away whatever sap I was getting on Sundays, and there was no fruit. It was a conscientious decision getting me back into the branch, drawing me back into Jesus, getting back into the vine and mending that branch. Some years later, ended up starting our own branches. All right. So now, just got the beating the snot out of everybody here with the, the last for a couple of verses here. I'm going to uh, I'm going to read verse 7 here. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. It simply means that if you stay in fellowship with Christ, then you're going to succeed with Christ. You see, this object here um, in some houses is used uh, to, to hold up a, a leg on a table to make sure it doesn't wobble, or, or it sits at Grandma's house open to John 3.16 as a dust collector. You know, the cool thing about this is that it's the Word of God. It teaches us every day of how we should live. It's His daily instruction. And if you want to stay in fellowship with Him, you need to read it. You know, try it. Try reading it. Try talking with God. Try walking with him try spending time with him and you'll be shocked to see what happens spread his word let others know that god will love them too if they uh, if if they ask him to there's a little nugget here at the at the end of the verse though it says uh you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you well does this mean that uh Do I get three wishes? No, it's not what it means. We don't got a genie that pops out of the Bible and says, what can I grant you? No, see, if you stay in abiding in Christ, if you, if you follow the last seven verses and you stay attached to the vine, see, your, your brain's going to change. Your, your, your relationship is going to change. You're going to start asking for things that are not of this world. And Pastor was talking about this a little bit uh, earlier this morning, which I, I found uh, awesome because I started working on this three months ago, and he's talking about it today. And God works in miraculous ways, right? And, you know, if you ask God to do things for you that are of God, he will make it happen. Things like, God, please save my brother's soul. God, I'm asking you to protect our men and women out on the front lines that, that might be down in Troy today and, um, and the National Guardsmen and the firefighters. I'm asking you to protect my family and, and, and the youth of our nation. These are, these are prayers. These are, these are requests of somebody that 
has gotten connected back to the vine and knows that what they're asking for is of God. Verse 8 says, By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. From the point at which you start walking with God and doing good works and spending time with Him, you'll notice branches of your very own starting to form. And that's when you'll start noticing that the discipleship happens. You see, nothing is sweeter. Uh, I truly believe nothing is sweeter than seeing somebody come to the saving knowledge of Christ. Anybody that's ever walked through this, this walk with somebody and, and seeing them just come to Christ, there's, there's nothing sweeter. But I can tell you there's something else that's actually, it's not as sweet, but it's still good. And that's actually watching somebody come into discipleship. I've actually been, I've had the pleasure of discipling uh, a few people and to, to see them get excited about the word of God and and to get excited about learning and then asking questions and you're answering questions and you guys are going through the Bible back and forth and, and this is good stuff. And then when you get to the end of discipleship, right? So, so we get to an end of a book and we say, okay, you've been discipled. Well, discipleship obviously never ends. It's a continual effort that goes on. However, the seeing that person's face just light up after being discipled and went, really? That's it? It's second to actually seeing them come to Christ. It's just, it's absolutely amazing. And, and, and that's what we need to be looking for. Again, that's bearing fruit. We need to be bearing fruit for Christ. <sighs> All right. So before I end here, I actually have a story, a quick story. I see I have a friend of mine, Jeremy, uh, and, and Jeremy lived in Rensselaer and he had a very small backyard. But the cool thing was, is in his backyard, it had a wide open area behind him. Nobody, there was a house off to the left, a house off to the right, wide open area. So Jeremy, uh, after a few years, that plot of land actually sold. Excuse me. Uh, actually sold. And they put up this monstrous house right in his back window. Terrible. I mean, the house didn't even fit in with the rest of it. All the houses are all capes. This thing was like a center hall colonial with, you know, everything else. Anyways, so all you do is walk out his backyard. So he got a little ticked off and, and uh, he did a bunch of research and he found out that arborvitaes are actually very, uh, very uh, um, fast growing trees, bushes. And he, and, and he did his research and found out what he had to put in the ground and everything else. And he asked me to come over and another couple of friends over and, and he bought 30 of these trees and we made a great big giant arbor fence. Now they were all six feet high. Not a big deal, right? So spent all day long, just just to on my knees all day long, toiling, burying these things. So anyways, uh, about uh, at the end of summer, he actually was quite perturbed when they only ended up growing about six inches. He was told these things would grow a foot, two, three feet in a year. It grew six inches. He was very upset. So the next spring... Um, he, he was, he was, he's a teacher or was a teacher, uh, down in Albany and, uh, his father-in-law came over and his father-in-law took out his hedge trimmer five foot high, cut them all down five foot high. Now, mind you, we planted these things. They were six foot plus at this point, Jeremy was irate. What'd you do that for? You, you cut down my bushes. Now they're even worse. Now I can really see the person's house. I tried everything to calm him down. He said, just wait. Just, just wait. See, what Jeremy didn't realize is, is by his father-in-law cutting down that top foot and a half, it allowed all that sun and moisture and, and water and everything else to actually get into the tree itself and that tree sprouted three feet that, that summer. 
And it continued to grow year after year after year after this. I remember walking out his back door when he sold the place. And I looked, I could barely even see the guy's house. You see, that's what God does. God's got to prune us. Because if he doesn't prune us, we're not going to grow. Is pruning tough? Yes. You're going to deal with trials. You're going to go through tribulations. But we need, we all need that trimming because we all need to bear fruit. So as we get ready to partake in the Lord's Supper service, I, I beg of you, take some time in this, in this time right now. Okay. Think about how God can use you. Think about how God can, how po God could possibly prune you to get you to start bearing fruit. Because if you're, if you don't, if you're not bearing fruit, you're just that sapling that, that just sucking the life and not giving anything back to Christ. Let's ask God to mend your branch if you think your branch is broken or breaking. Has anybody here ever tried to break a branch off of a vine? It ain't easy. You know what's cool though? Even if your branch is broken, Jesus is the great surgeon. He can fix it for you. So let's go into prayer and uh, pastor will uh, get into our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this time. God, I thank you for um, giving me the ability to come up here and give your message, Lord. God, I just pray that you use each one of us in our in your own special way, Lord. I pray that you, you prune us um, and you uh, just guide us so that we can bear more fruit for you. Lord, I just want to say I thank you and love you for everything that you do for us, keeping us protected. Um, be with Pastor John as he's getting ready to come on up here and, and uh, give us a little bit more. And thank you and love you. Amen. We at Connecting Point Church are excited to have you join us. When you come, you'll experience a friendly, lively, and casual family-like atmosphere that welcomes you as you are. Our messages combine straightforward biblical truths, humor, and life-changing challenges for you to learn and grow in God's Word. We believe in connecting people to Christ, to the plans and gifts He has for them, and with people in our community who share these values. We also believe in reaching out to our local area and the regions beyond. We're dedicated to being a place where your entire family can believe, belong, and become all that God intends you to be. Discover the abundance of life in Jesus Christ as you begin to understand the roots of the problems and learn to apply the tools for you to triumph over your challenges today. It'll be a breath of fresh air in this unsettled world.